for everyone just jumping on, we might wait a couple more minutes to get everyone out of the waiting room. So hold tight before we kick things off. Looks like people are jumping in now, so. Great, maybe just another minute or so, and then we'll have Rob jump in with introductions. First, just want to welcome everyone. Uh, today, we're going, going to be discussing grazing and how to kind of capitalize on, on, uh, on better management of our grass when it comes to livestock and, and ranching operations. Uh, the panel is a great group of people that have had decades worth of experience in the industry in various geographies. Um, first and foremost, I just want to hand it over to Rob Cook to kick things off and then we'll pass it around for introductions. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kobe. Um... On behalf of AgriWeb, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the Getting More Green from Your Grazing webinar. Um, as you said, I'm Rob Cook. I serve as, uh, will serve, a pleasure to serve as the moderator uh, for this panel discussion. And uh, I think everyone's in for a great treat. This is an outstanding panel and, uh, and, and, I, and I'm really um, uh, blessed to, to be a part of this. Um, I serve as the vice chairman for the National Grazing Lands Coalition. And then also as uh, the director of Be uh, business development for Bammer Seed Company. So uh, on behalf of AgriWeb, I know that everyone's excited uh, to have brought this group of panelists together. And these are really thought leaders in the regenerative, uh, regenerative agriculture space. And uh, you know, talking with folks uh, from AgriWeb, I know they really hope that these webinars give a set of tools and some resources to our farmers and ranchers to ensure that uh, there's knowledge uh, passed along, uh, so their legacies continue uh, continue for generations to come on these on these farms and ranches. Just a little housekeeping, kind of before we get started. Um, in, in respect for everyone's time, uh, we're going to have a Q and A session, kind of at the end of all these presentations. So feel free to go ahead and and add uh, add your your questions on the chat, uh, but be sure to uh, put who those questions are directed towards. Uh, so we know uh, dur during that session uh, who, who the question was asked of. Um, so we're, we're going to go ahead and, and have uh, the, the panelists kind of introduce themselves uh, real quick and, and, and where they're from, uh, who they represent, a little bit about themselves, and then we'll get we'll get into the, the heart of the presentations. Uh, each one will be about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so, so Kobe, if you'd like to start us off. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And, and I probably won't be as active in this panelist group, um, uh, more so just being the representative from AgriWeb. But my name's Kobe Buck. I grew up on a ranch in eastern Colorado. Uh, our family has been out there for about five generations. Uh, our family operations a commercial black Angus cow calf uh, operation. So we, we primarily raise calves and, and we, we're looking to diversify into stalkers. But Overall, we, we deploy a rotational grazing um, design. Our, our typical rotations are seven to 10 days, but um, at AgriWeb, I serve as the US accounts manager. So once people kind of sign up for AgriWeb, a lot of people touch base with me very often to, to align their strategic goals around grazing or around their overall operation with, uh, with the product in it itself. But great to be with you all. Okay, great, Thank, thanks, Kobe. Um, Jim, we'll, we'll, go to, we'll go to you next. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Jen Livesey, and um, I uh, come from a, a very similar, in fact, the same family as Kobe. Uh, our great great grandfather um, started ranching in eastern Colorado in 1907, so I'm fifth generation. Um, we have employed, um, you know, rotational, regenerative, whatever your phrase of the day is. <laughs> Um, for about 30 years on a ranch. I'm very involved in that. Um, and, you know, it's a, a commercial cow-calf yearling and seed stock operation. 
Um, it's 100% family owned. Uh, and so I will also talk a little bit about um, how the family works together um, and kind of divvies up duties and thinks about sustainability uh, from a business perspective, business organization perspective in our ranch. Great, Jen, thank you. I look, look forward to it. Uh, Jeff. Good afternoon, Rob. Uh, my name is Jeff Goodwin. I'm a senior range and pasture consultant at Noble Research Institute in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Um, we work with uh, ranchers across the Southern Great Plains. Uh, uh, we, we own and operate about 14,000 acres in Southern Oklahoma, around about 600 mother cows. And, and we're trying to work with producers to help them uh, regenerate their own grazing glands. So happy to be here today. Yeah, it's great to have you, Jeff. Thanks for being here. And um, I don't think Mr. Uh, Bob McCann has, has been able to get on yet. Maybe a little bit of technical difficulties there, but uh, I'm sure he's coming. I'll go ahead and let you know Bob is the uh, owner of McFadden Enterprises, a uh, ranching operation, uh, South Texas. He's also currently serves as the president uh, for the Global uh, Roundtable for Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Kind of a mouthful, and I butchered it a little bit. But it's a, 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 a it's great to have Bob on. A lot of experience there, and we look forward to, to seeing his presentation. Um, so I guess kind of without further ado, we'll we'll get into our presentations. And uh, to my please, everyone, uh, put your questions in, and we look forward to a great conversation. We'll go ahead and start this off a little bit with with Kobe Buck, maybe on a little bit of, of these uh, grazing basics. So Kobe, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And, and in addition to questions, we love hearing from people kind of who, who they are and where they're tuning in from. So if you have questions or simply want to introduce yourself via the chat, we encourage you to do so. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick. It seems like when we talk about grazing, there's when we talk about grazing, there is a lot of kind of similar vocabulary that goes through and not a whole lot of um, People can consider sustainability the same thing as sustainability and the verbiage gets a little confusing. For the, the panelists speaking today, uh, I decided to create a, a five minute presentation to, to walk through how we really define grazing and to bring everyone up to the same spot. So as Bob and, and Jennifer come in and talk about what they deploy on their operation, hopefully it allows you to, to better understand it and, and understand all of the different vocabulary. So. What is grazing management? Uh, this is my personal definition of it, but it's a protocol to design or designed to efficiently manage livestock on grant on grasslands. The result in tangible improvements to the underlying ecosystem, forage, and livestock. And when it comes to the different types of rotations and the different types of grazing management plans, uh, it's really a skew. You have continuous on one side and then intensive grazing on the other side. So. The figures down below is continuous, uh, typically one to four moves per year. Rotational grazing steps that up a notch when it comes to movements, and it's rotating these animals through multiple paddocks uh, every month or couple of months, so one to four moves a month. And then intensive is really a, a lot shorter in duration as far as the, how long the animals are in any given paddock. And I would typically bucket that into one to four moves per week. They're typically smaller pastures. Uh, you graze each location fairly intensively and then look to provide adequate rest. So in the basic continuous rotation, you have around 180 days rest. Rotational movements, you can have upwards of 250 days rest on any given pasture, depending on how frequent you graze those. And then intensive is really where you can get to 360 days rest, if not more, on any pasture or, any, uh, or paddock that, that you put cattle in. Now, when we talk about grass, so um, you will hear, hear forage used a lot. So forage is basically the amount of, of digestible feed on the ground that each pasture has. If you look to the right and you see uh, these different curves, depending on if it's warm season or cool season, if it's a legume or uh, the red lines, big blue stem, each one of these different varieties of grass have different growth curves. So um, during the 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 early spring, you'll see the, the cool seasons pick up. And then as the heat index rises, their growth will fall off. And then depending on your location, you might get a second growth 
uh, kind of in the cool season of the fall. The warm season grasses really kind of kick off their growth pretty rapidly as that heat index rises. And overall, what does this mean? Well, depending on where you're located, if you're native or improved grass, depending on these growth curves, you have to manage that grass to last you your entire grazing season. So you can't take too much off in the summer because you need to stockpile it through the fall and winter. So each operation will have a different growth curve and they need to align their, their grazing according to that. Forage amounts, um, you hear dry matters per acre is, is oftentimes the, the, the traditional way of measuring grass. Um, more modern grazing plans use animal unit days per acre if they're focusing on livestock but we can touch on that in the next slide. Utilization is just the total forage allocated toward consumption for those livestock. And then the forage growth calendar is, is exemplified to the right um, by the, this chart that we drew up. When it goes to now looking at your livestock, when it comes to units of measurement, uh, the, the traditional units of measurement is animal units. And an animal unit strictly an, an, uh, an, a thousand pound animal with or without a calf nursing outside and consumes about 2.6% of, uh, of its body weight or 26 pounds of dry matter per day. Of course, no animal really weighs exactly a thousand pounds. You will have stalkers, calves, yearlings, bulls, and we then normalize each animal based off of their weight group. It correlates with their weight, but it's not a one-to-one, -one, just divide by a thousand. So if you look on the diagram on the left, this is typically an animal unit equivalent um, calendar designed by North Dakota State University. And you can see a weaned animal is 0.75, a yearling is 0.85, and then that big bull that's 2,000 pounds is 2.0. Each animal has a scheme and it kind of normalizes how productive each pasture is on if they were animal, if each animal was an, a thousand pound animal. And then an animal unit day, it kind of gets complicated at times where it's like, it sounds complex, but really it's just a daily serving uh, for an animal unit on any given pasture. So the equivalent of tw uh, 26 pounds for a thousand pound animal. And then just other lingo that you might hear today would be density, the number of animals in the herd in relation to the size of the pasture. So that could be 10 head across 100 acres or 100 head across 100 acres. That's a, a different density calculation. Durations, the average length of time animals graze any paddock. Uh, frequency is the number of times that you, you graze that paddock over the course of the year. Utilizations, the, the percent of the forage consumed by animals. And then recovery is the number of days that a pasture has to regrow before you revisit and, and graze it. Uh, you can just kind of see uh, what this all looks like and how it correlates. So um, on the right hand side, there's a chart that says number of head is in, or number of animal units is in the green, grazing days are, are in the blue. This is the same pasture just stocked differently. So 25 head can last 58 days and then 200 head are good for about 70 days in this, this one pasture. And down below, you can see if you have more frequencies and you have a targeted utilization rate, you can start to see, okay, frequencies might come into uh, play as far as having the maximum amount of forage growth and having a, a greater utilization on each given pasture. I think this deck will be sent out afterwards. So if you want to revisit it, no problem at all. But I think that that's all that I have. Um, let's see, I'm just thinking with Bob's internet connection, um, it might make sense to move over to Jennifer so she can walk through what we're doing at Flying Diamond. And I appreciate your guys' patience. I think everyone wants to hear from Bob, but hopefully in the meantime, we can get him up and running. Uh, but Jen, I'll stop and, and let you take it away from there. Great, thank you, Kobe. Um, give me one second, I'm gonna get on there. Okay, uh, Kobe, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet, you might try to click that green share button again. Okay. There we go. 
There we go. Okay. Um, as I introduced myself, I'm um, Eastern Plains of Colorado. Um, uh, so kind of the heart of the Great Plains, um, a pretty arid environment. Um, you know, we're 14, 15 inches of annual rainfall. Uh, uh, and we've been there for over um, 100 years. Um, uh, there's, uh, we've grown. Um, I'm one of four um, in my generation, um, run it with my parents. Uh, the ecosystem that we are operating in is primarily short grass and sand sage prairie. Uh, the ranch is totally native. Um, there is no nor planted other grasses or anything. So um, we are dealing with a pretty natural environment. We do have um, a big creek that runs through us. Um, it's named aptly, it's called Big Sandy Creek. So uh, there's not often running water in there, but it is a very productive um, area of our ranch. Uh, we do get a lot of forage growth along that creek. Um, the soils that we have, um, primarily sandy and loamy. Um, this uh, picture that I'm showing now um, is on some of our loamier soil. Uh, and this was June, 2020. Um, we were in a pretty intense drought and you can see that there's not a lot of green and not really a lot of anything out there. Um, you know, we're very used to operating in uh, periods of drought. Um, we always expect the next drought to come. And, you know, that is a huge uh, factor that we take into account when we are doing our grazing planning. Um, just stepping out kind of bigger picture than grazing um, for one second. Uh, you know, we kind of operate and I feel lucky to have had this kind of pounded into my head as a little girl, um, the concept of holism that what we are doing on the ranch is kind of balancing our, um, the, the people and, you know, what we, you know, skill sets, what we like to do, what we have to do, what the business has to accomplish and what our land is capable of. Um, and balance, balancing all of those is sustainability to us. Um, and uh, kind of a, a key concept is that, you know, balancing those uh, is not a stagnant task. It is changing all of the time um, and everything is interconnected. Um, you know, kind of if you pull on one thread, it's connected to everything else. So a uh, huge uh, lesson in our family is always to be adaptable. Um, everything's gonna change all the time. So um, how do you, you know, improve uh, and you have to do that through paying attention and changing. Um, kind of another huge tenant of that holistic um, mindset to us is nature is smart as hell. Um, and what that means is nature very much dictates our um, operation, uh, how and when we produce the cattle we do. Um, and tied very closely to that is being very low input. Um, the picture I have here is my mom and daughter feeding cattle. This is uh, some of very little feed that they get throughout the year. Um, uh, we really design our entire operation to minimize the amount of supplemental feed any animal gets in our system. Uh, we do do some supplemental feeding um, kind of the month leading up to uh, calving and the first few weeks of calving. Uh, we do not calve until early to mid-May. Um, that's when our um, kind of forage cycle kicks in. Uh, so we really try to match our um, cattle's needs to the, the land. Uh, we run um, a composite breed um, of kind of our own make. Uh, we have black cattle, we have red cattle, we would run purple cattle if they were plump in our management system. 
which is a pretty strict system. If you do not have, you do not make the team. Um, we coal very heavily. Um, we put a lot of pressure on our animals. Um, and, you know, we want animals that are very fitted to our environment and our management system. Uh, you know, and this is, again, uh, a pretty intense drought last year, and these cattle have to make do on, um, you know, kind of not that exciting to look at feed right when they have their calf. Um, and this is the best it got last year. Uh, and, you know, here's what I mean by our system. This is our intensive grazing system. And like probably most ranches, um, you know, for decades and decades, it was kind of set stock, continuous grazing. Um, when uh, my dad started doing this in about 1990, we chopped up pastures into basically half sections. Um, and then last year, uh, coincidentally in the middle of this huge drought, we decided to go even more intensively than that. So we are now um, with polywire fencing, splitting every single pasture on our ranch into at least half um, up to four paddocks. Um, and that is what we are trying to accomplish is grazing any one acre on our ranch fewer days of the year, um, but more intensely when we do. Um, you know, I am in charge of kind of monitoring, tracking all our grazing and what I am trying to accomplish is, you know, some uniformity of grazing over um, the pastures, knowing what their soil type is, knowing how many days we graze there, you know, how, how, what are we overdoing? What are we underdoing? And how do we plan for next year? Um, we did implement this um, a couple of summers ago. We started uh, summering heifers and breeding heifers up in a mountain valley. And it's even more intense up there. It's, you know, daily, if not half daily moves. Um, we also incorporate uh, crop stubble into our program. Um, most of our cows winter on corn stalks. Um, those are nearby us in Western Kansas. Um, you know, a big part, you know, it's not grazing, uh, but it absolutely impacts our grazing. Uh, we have kind of formalized our family's business structure. Uh, we have regular board meetings. We write things down. We have standard operating procedures. Um, and we have brought on employees um, in the past few years for the first time in a long time. And so that's been really important to the success of a ranch overall, but our grazing program in particular. Um, resources that we use, um, I would say absolutely primarily, it's going to be our peers. We as a family are not shy about um, finding ranchers that we think are doing smart, innovative things and essentially inviting ourselves to their ranch to pick their brain. Um, this picture here, uh, we hosted a field trip. That's uh, Jim Garrish. He's a well-known grazing guru. We just invited a bunch of ranchers um, to come for a field day. Uh, we do use some experts. Again, Jim Garrish, uh, Jaime Elizondo has been to the ranch. Um, you know, we do use NRCS, the uh, Colorado State University, um, and we're you know, very actively involved as a family in various cattlemen's organizations as well. Uh, as far as technology, um, I mapped the whole ranch in great detail um, many years ago on Google Earth. We are using AgriWeb now. Um, we're using something called farm logs to track rainfall. Um, I have relied heavily on the NRCS Web Soil Survey. Um, I personally do a grazing chart, which I'm hoping to transition fully to AgriWeb and not have to do that. Um, there are uh, rangeland um, carrying capacity tool that you can find online. I recently found a super awesome app where you can take a picture of a plant and it will tell you what it is. Um, useful for rangeland monitoring, which I've been doing this fall. Um, as far as, you know, wish lists and where do we go from here, I cannot wait for um, accurate uh, satellite monitoring to be widespread. Um, and I think there is a huge opportunity for um, uh, the chance to tell our story through that and um, strengthen our connection with consumers. And, you know, I'm also very excited 
and some are cautious about the ecosystem markets that are arising. And I think, you know, our grazing program that we've been doing for decades is, you know, can set up, up set us up really well um, to realize some of those benefits. Um, but they don't have to come to fruition. We're still going to do what we're doing because our grazing system, you know, I think really works for us. Um, we feel good about it from a drought resiliency point, from an animal um, performance point, and from a land health point. Um, you know, those are kind of the, the key parts for us. Um, if you want to know more about us, uh, we're at flyingdiamondcattleranch.com. Um, again, the, my whole family is in that picture and my sister-in-law built the website. So truly uh, a, a family operation um, and you know, what we do on the land is really, really important to us. Great, Jen, we appreciate your time. We appreciate you uh, filling us in a little bit about your, your operation. I really uh, enjoy the fact that you outlined some of the things you're doing as a family in the meetings and the board meetings. I think that's one thing that uh, gets lost a lot when we talk about our uh, farm and ranch operations and how we manage them. Something's very important. <clears throat> so I look forward to maybe more discussion on that in the future, uh, in the question answering. Great job. I really appreciate it. Sure, everyone does. Um, I think I think uh, Mr. McCann still having a few technical difficulties. Um, Toby, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, and on that, I mean, I think that uh, I will not do Bob as much justice talking about his operation as, as he would, but hopefully he can he can get online a little bit. Um, we sincerely apologize to everyone jumping uh, on and attending. It's just the name of this game, I guess, since we can't do as much stuff in person as every once in a while there's a, an internet outage and Unfortunately, I think Bob is, is experiencing that now. So what I can do is I, I can share the screen and tell everyone a little bit about Bob's operation to give you another understanding of, of what exactly uh, is a grazing plan. And it can be as, as complex as Jennifer's or it can be fairly simple with, with high values that you focus on. Bob's is definitely a mixture of two of things. So if everyone can see, see my screen okay, Bob McCann runs uh, McFadden Enterprise. His family's been out there for multiple generations. Uh, here's just a picture of a couple of his Bradford cows uh, sitting next to an old windmill. And his location uh, and his ecosystem is really Gulf Coast Prairies near Victoria, Texas. It's kind of right in between Corpus Christi and Houston and not too far away from the ocean. Um, if you see this map over here, it shows you just um, days rest on certain pastures that Bob has managed. And the, go, the, the coast is actually probably five or 10 miles just to the, to the east of, of his operation. When it comes to their ecosystem and the management practices, pretty much all of the grass at McFadden Enterprises is all native. But due to the fact that he's in, in the Southern Texas area, uh, they actually have a much longer uh, growth season than I think Jennifer's uh, operation or, or a lot of the operations up north have. Uh, as of right now, they're approximately 20% cool season and 80% warm season. So the growth curve of forage on his operation goes from really starts to pick up March, April, May. And then as that, that heat index rises, um, the cool seasons taper off and you get a, a massive growth of warm season. But Bob is one of those instances where, where these cool season grasses have a second growth in the fall period. So they produce a lot of forage across the, the operation year round, which helps with his management decisions and has helped a lot with, with his grazing plan. Overall, I think talking with Bob in preparation for this webinar, Bob uh, just really discussed how important water is when it comes to the uniformity of their grazing design. So. Over the past 20 or 30 years, they have built out uh, infrastructure to have about three to four water systems in each pasture at each corner so that cattle don't have to travel miles on end to get water. Uh, they can travel three quarters of a mile and be close to water so that they can get out into the middle of the pasture and utilize some of the forage there. When describing McFadden um, Enterprises in, in the ranch in Victoria, uh, Bob's method of management is a low to mid density and a moderate duration grazing design. So they have three herds scattered across the operation. 
uh, and each one of those herd groups rotates between five and eight cells. The duration of any given graze is about three weeks. Uh, sometimes that depends on, sometimes they move faster if the grass is growing well or, or if they're in drought. Um, other times when they're in the middle of calving, they might move a little bit slower. So he rotate, he's kind of in that rotational regi regime. Um, and that all kind of depends on rainfall. But a major part of Bob's um, management practices would be recovery. So uh, since they have a year long growth season, it's not that one growth and stockpile it uh, for, for days on end. Uh, so, but he wants every pasture on their operation to have between 90 and 120 uh, days of, of rest, recovery and regrowth before animals come back through. And then similar to what Jen was discussing about when it comes to the ideal animal for the ecosystem, the ideal animal for an operation, Bob has worked in, in, in incredibly hard on really finding a, an animal that works well in the heat of South Texas, that performs on native grassland. And over the course of decades, they, they've really built out a, a unique animal. It's called the Victoria Brafford. It's three quarter Herefords and one quarter Brahma. Um, red hided, uh, kind of has that quarter ear to, to manage the heat pretty well. But Bob has built out uh, the, this, this type of braid and often sells bulls that fits other neighboring operations that might align with what they need. Uh, typically, he doesn't want a mature weight over 1200 and targets about 1175. So any animal can, can produce a calf that he can run maybe more ahead as opposed to larger individuals and, and be able to really have that that maternal design that can get out there and, and walk a couple miles and graze all day. So like Jen, he has a, an animal that works for his ecosystem. And I think it's important to note, McFadden Enterprises, it didn't start off as a, a rotational grazing design. Uh, when Bob kind of took the reins and became the active manager of their, their operations. Uh, it started in the 1990s. He, he looked at the forage and saw that big blue stem was, was very hard to find on the pastures. So he started building out uh, and subdividing fences in 92. That took him about seven years to fence off the entire ranch with a three wire electric fence. But he's been operating um, this rotational grazing regime for about 20 years now. And it really has allowed them to become more resilient when drought hits. I know about 10 years ago, there's an awful drought or yeah, 10 years ago, there's an awful drought in Texas. And then there's always um, these, these pretty difficult droughts coming and coming out. So his management is to when that drought occurs and, and when it becomes pretty intense, he in increases rests and moves cattle more frequently, and then also looks to destock on the non-producing non cattle. So he cools heavier, looks at uh, breed up days in addition to just opener bread to, to make the decision of which animals should go, which ones are kind of lagging behind in my, my calving season, and, and really make sure that the grass doesn't get punished for, uh, for the lack of rain in any give, given year. Now looking at the results after 20 years of deploying this rotational grazing scheme with, with uh, low to mid uh, intensity and, and mid, mid to uh, medium duration, uh, every paddock that previously graded average may be good in some areas, now grades good to excellent as far as forage quality out there. Uh, the perennial decreasers that are tough to bring back have increased in population and the invasive increasers as far as forage are, are largely uh, decreased. Now, uh, looking at the big blue stem population, there's about 20% of all forage on their operation is, is big blue stem. And that's something I think Bob looks at and, and just seeing the results of what grazing and grazing management have, have brought to fruition over 20 years is, is something that is pretty incredible. you can look on the left, there's a multitude of pictures of, of the, the Victoria Brawfords out there grazing at the different locations. You can hey, see Kobe. Um, yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. But great news. I think I think Bob is on. If uh, if he wants to join the conversation, you're doing a. I think you're doing a fantastic job of 
letting us know. But uh, Bob, are, are you there? Are you available to kind of to add to the conversation or take over? Yeah, Bob, and you might be on mute, but that's good news because I think it's awesome to see Bob on. Let's give it one second. Bob, you might uh, check to see if you can turn yourself off mute. Um, it should be kind of in the bottom left-hand corner or maybe up top on your screen. Let's see here. All right, as Bob's uh, kind of looking to get audio back, Bob, just feel free to jump in once we get uh, the audio, audio set up. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll, I'll continue talking about what you deploy over here at McFadden Enterprises. At McFadden, um, in addition to the, the, the livestock management, uh, there, there's off, also a major focus on wildlife in the ecosystem. Oh, Bob, can you hear us now? There's a, there's a major focus on, on wildlife in the ecosystem as well. Uh, they conduct annual surveys on, on deer population, quail population, and, and other forms of li livestock. When it comes to his management, uh, he factors in livestock populations so of how many deer are there and, and adapts his uh, livestock stocking rate uh, to just not in, intrude too much on the wildlife needs from a forage perspective. And depending on, on droughts or any given year, they track the, the number of deer harvested from the operation as well, or from the ecosystem as well. Uh, and when things get dry, they might issue more tags to to harvest more animals just to kind of create that natural balance uh, in the ecosystem and maintain a, a strong buck to doe ratio for, for the wildlife as a whole. Year to year, when talking to Bob about his priorities and his goals and um, whatnot at McFadden and in the, the, the wildlife regime, he, he really focuses a lot on, okay, we want our wildlife to exhibit strong antler qualities, uh, strong male to female ratios, and be adaptable like the livestock side of things to accommodate everything that, that is present on the ranch during years of drought or years of, of high moisture. And moving forward, um, Bob and McFadden's Enterprises, uh, and goals are to integrate wildlife and the, the livestock grazing management more and more. So perhaps even ca capturing um, a grazing footprint of the wildlife in addition to the, the animals on the ranch and really knowing the overall stocking rate between different species. Uh, he, he wants to continue and, and, and grow his, his holistic management design by increasing biodiversity and measuring biodiversity, whether it's uh, biodiversity in plants or, or soil microbials or um, just overall wildlife, just really aligning it and growing uh, the overall ecosystem and, and increasing its, its presence across the, the board. He also wants to start implementing um, soil monitoring, rangeland moder moderating and monitoring and, and water yields. So looking at uh, where the productive wells are, being able to make sure that water is not a factor into the grazing regime in a negative way, but more so it's accessible to any animal on the operation so that they can have a more uniform grazing design. And another way that they can manage that is build out more infrastructure on the water side, but also look to subdivide the different sides of the operation as a whole to maybe get smaller paddocks, more rotations, 
and thus more rest and recovery for any given acre. I think that that's all we ha have for Bob. So I'll hand it back to you, Rob. Great, thank you, Kobe. That was a phenomenal job uh, being able to, to present uh, some of your material. Thank you, I think a pretty good understanding for everybody. Um, and I hate that we, we couldn't have uh, Bob on, but like you said before, technical difficulties, it's just kind of the world we live in at the moment. Um, I would mention uh, if you are in Texas, there could be an opportunity to get to see Bob soon. Uh, I think we'll be touring uh, his ranch's operation as well as to the technical tour for the uh, Texas Section Society for Range Management meeting uh, down in Victoria, October 22nd. So uh, if you're if you're in the area, that'd be a great opportunity to be able to, to meet Bob in person. Um, so we move on through our uh, through our agenda here and, uh, and and bring in Jeff Goodwin with the uh, Noble Research Institute. Jeff, how are, how are things over in Oklahoma? It's good. It was a little dry for a spell, but we just got two inches yesterday, so I'm happy. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Are those, uh, are those uh, noble cows in your background there, Jeff? They are. Yes, sir. This is at our coffee ranch. That's great. Yeah, it's looking good. So Je Jeff and I thought we would maybe just have a little bit of a a discussion today to uh, maybe discuss some of these these principles and these ideas uh, that Jen and Bob are using every day in their in their management. Um, oh, Bob's getting close. There's Bob. Oh, I don't know if we have audio yet. We can see Not you, Bob. Yet. Bob. Can't hear you. <laughs> Bob, if you can just look to unmute, I think that we'll be able to hear you then. I think we're good there now, we Bob. Go. Can you all hear me? We can, Bob. Can Welcome. Me? We can, yes, sir. Okay, Welcome. sorry. Sorry about all this, but uh, I'm really not sure what happened. I did three Zoom calls yesterday and, and uh, no problem. But anyway, um, Kobe did, uh, I got to hear most of Kobe's presentation. He did an excellent job. So um, is everybody hearing me? Okay. So uh, I'll just add a little bit, Kobe, if it's all right. And I hate to mess up the time, but. Uh, Absolutely. And Bob, I think you might be logged in twice. If you turn the vol volume down on the other computer, you should be good to go. Yep. How about now? It's better? Yep, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, I apologize again for all this trouble. But uh, yeah, just a few things I might add to, to uh, what Kobe said. And uh, we are down here in the Gulf Coast prairies of uh, Texas and Victoria County. And... Uh, the uh, the map that Kobe had up earlier is our home ranch here at McFadden and uh, all native grasses. But uh, I will just kind of add to a little bit because I got to hear most of what you said, Kobe. And, and uh, our, our uh, general uh, management style on the grazing here is uh, basically, you know, with a goal towards improving range condition and uh, which, uh, as you said, we've we've seen a huge improvement over the last really 20, 25 years that we've been uh, in, in a rotation. And uh, we have uh, basically a one herd, five to eight pasture rotations. We have three of those herds, three of those rotations on this this particular ranch. But uh, uh, we, we rotate into the to the paddocks for uh, anywhere from two to three weeks, depending on conditions. Uh, basically, uh, two weeks if it's uh, if it is a, a higher high growing season, you know, uh, warm season, lots of lots of moisture and things are going fast. Uh, if we're dry or uh, in the Winter time, slower growing, uh, will slow down and stay in the paddocks a little bit longer, maybe a week longer. And uh, 
kind of average, you know, anywhere from uh, three to four months rest uh, before we enter, enter uh, by the time we enter, enter the next pasture, uh, th they will have that much rest, but before the herd enters. Um, just to talk a little bit, I'll, I'll go into the, uh, about our cattle. And uh, we do have a three quarter Hereford, uh, quarter Brahmin animal that uh, my grandfather uh, kind of perfected that commercial purebred uh, a long time ago. And we've just been improving on it through the years. And uh, as it relates to the grazing system, that's kind of one of our other real indicators is, uh, is basically body condition of the cattle. So we, uh, we monitor that and watch that and we've certainly during since we've been in a rotating uh, scheme that we've certainly been able to maintain a consistent better body conditions uh, throughout the year uh, more so than in the past and uh, certainly better uh, uh, added added uh, calf crop and and uh, and winning weights and all those things on the wildlife side which we always uh, kind of like to try to integrate uh, our wildlife goals with our livestock uh, production goals there in the grazing system. And uh, on the wildlife side, uh, the indicator that we kind of look for is, is uh, you know, good diversity within the pasture, the native pasture. We'd like to see a little bit of uh, uh, more browse species. And uh, can y'all still hearing me good? Okay, uh, so we like to see a little more browse species and uh, Bob White quail are a pretty good indicator species for us uh, down here. And just if we've got healthy Bob White populations and healthy uh, things going on that are not weather related, uh, we, we usually will see improvements in the Bob White population. Uh, they're a good indicator species. Uh, antler development, and antler quality in the white-tailed deer is, is another one. And uh, that kind of tells us whether we've got the right chow out there and kind of goes, goes along with uh, the goals of our livestock production uh, schemes in that, you know, if we're, if we're allowing enough rest, uh, rest within the rotation, we're going to get those, uh, those good uh, native browse species, the, clovers and betches and, and different, uh, even actually different weeds and, uh, that will, that will come, uh, Texas croton is one that's kind of interesting that ends up coming in, in some of the better rain sites. And, uh, other than that, I'd like to speak just real quickly about, uh, soils and, uh, we try to, do, we're, we're beginning to try to monitor a little bit of soil health and, uh, we haven't done that much of that in the past other than along with the range condition. But um, one thing that we are uh, thinking about doing is trying to monitor. So we have some real hard pan, kind of heavier clay soils in this part of the world. And on, on our ranch, uh, it's, it's probably 70% of the, of the soil type. So those, those eco sites are a little bit harder to get uh, really good improvement, range improvement on, and, and uh, sometimes need to be managed a little bit differently. So going forward, that's one of our goals to maybe uh, take that into consideration on our cross fencing and on our, our rest rotation uh, to allow for possibly a little more rest or a little different uh, type of uh, fence those areas uh, a little differently than we have in the past. Uh, other than that, I'm uh, I'm kind of mixing and matching here with what y'all already heard from Matt, so I don't want to take up too much time. So, uh, well, Bob, thank you. We appreciate your your time and uh, spreading a little bit of your knowledge. And thanks for working through the technical issues. And uh, and we work. I uh, look forward maybe to a little bit of the, the, the Q and A with you. Maybe some folks have some direct questions for you. And, and, and getting those answered. But, but again, thanks for working through that. And it's good to see you. Sure. Thank you, Rob. Well, we'll we can, uh, we can move on. Um, I'm glad that worked out and everybody got to meet Bob and, uh,
we can move on and have a little bit of a discussion with Jeff. Jeff, um, when 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 we talk about the idea of regenerative agriculture and and what that means and and what those what those processes are that that are involved with that, and what those ideas are, um, it might be a new way to manage uh, for some folks and maybe especially in the in the agronomic world, but it's the really it's really not new ideas is it it's something that's kind of been around um maybe yeah it's a, <clears throat> i mean i i don't want regenerative management to get the you know coin the new buzzword um because really what we're talking about is managing for ecological processes managing uh you know, determining what practices we put on a property uh, based on these principles that that we tend to try to follow, like keeping the ground covered and increasing diversity, and and sort of have a, trying to have a live root in the ground year round. You know, these are these are principles that that were developed a number of years ago by a group of 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 ranchers. Um, you know, it's or, or farmers rather on on a crop on cropland. Um, and, you know, they wanted to uh, ultimately mimic some of the things that were happening in rangeland ecosystems. And so, um, but this, this idea about managing for ecosystems um, is, has been around a long time. Um, the term regenerative was around in the 80s. I mean, uh, folks at Rodale Institute uh, were, were using it, you know, 20 years ago. We worked into, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, starting to talk about this idea of soil health and managing for soil health. And then about five to six years ago, the, the, the term regenerative agriculture and regenerative ranching started to spin out. And, and, and really, again, it's just this concept of, of, of focusing on, on these primary ecosystem processes. And we're talking about the energy cycle, our ability to capture sunlight and convert that, convert that uh, through uh, a, a process through photosynthesis and, and really just having a functional biological system above ground and below ground um, to, to create that forage product that we, that we use uh, in our grazing systems. We're talking about the water cycle, uh, rebuilding a hydrologic function on these sites, uh, nutrient cycling and then and then plant community dynamics do we have the right kinds amounts of plants uh, on that landscape to meet our context whether it's in muleshoe texas or the eastern slope of the rockies or in ardmore oklahoma yeah i mean i think that's a great point jeff is is um all these all these processes uh, are, are basically the same processes that we're managing we might go a little bit different way about how we manage those processes based off where we are and kind of how it fits our system and our, and our management. But managing those processes is, is, the, is, is how we achieve those uh, regenerative agriculture ideas. And, and uh, it's not just the implementation of, of practices, is it? It's uh, the use of practices to, uh, to manage these processes. And uh, you know, I think to me, one of the keys is is not just implementing a practice and then walking away and forgetting it. It's, it's the monitoring piece of it. Can you uh, maybe expand on that? Touch? Well, yeah, it's it's this idea of 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 you can't you can't manage what you're not measuring. And um, you know, we again when we start talking about how a lot of these processes work, they start with what you know the foundation of terrestrial agriculture on the planet is our soil, and um, it, it all starts there. And, and understanding the health and the functionality of the soils, um, you know, we, we hear a lot about we hear a lot about carbon nowadays, um, and certainly um, organic carbon, organic matter. Um, or, or organic matter is about 58% soil organic carbon, uh, roughly, and that's really the driver of the system. It's the it's the currency in which things happen underground. These these plants are ex exuding these uh, these carbohydrates and these these metabolites, and the soil biology are, are exchanging nutrients for those. Um, and so there's this this underground economy happening, um, and and it's really about really focusing on having that functional system in the ground and how, how do you know it's 
it's happening? How do you know things are benefiting? Well, we only know uh, really what we can see with our eyes. And so observation plays a key role in monitoring. But I can't remember what I did Tuesday, much less what my pastor looked like last Thursday, you know, two years ago. So, you know, using things like something as simple as photo points, um, you know, doing a, a simple step transect and just looking at these large functional groups of plants, you know, or my grass is increasing in, in uh, uh, you know, in frequency or composition. You don't necessarily have to get to the species. It's awesome if you do, but um, just understanding that those, the plants that you want, manage for what you want. And, and, and uh, if those, those plants are getting, uh, you know, in greater composition or, or uh, density, then, then we're moving in the right direction. There's a whole host of things that we can measure from the soil health perspective. Um, again, I, I think we're just, really scraping the surface on what we're learning about about soils you know there's this idea that well we're uh you know we're gonna we're gonna potentially saturate uh our soils uh and 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 we're gonna we're gonna fill them full of carbon well we, that won't happen in our lifetime so um you know we've lost a tremendous amount of soil carbon across our, our grazing lands um it's a tremendous we, we're posed with a tremendous opportunity to be a um a solution in the in the climate fight and um I just think producers are, are, you know, we're we're sitting in a great position to be able to, to to be an advocate uh, for good management, and and it really all starts with it really all starts with with increasing organic matter, man, managing for these ecosystem processes and simple principles. Um, all of these practices that we focus on, they're tools. The tools aren't taken out of the box. We use them. You do. We use them when uh, we need to to uh, to focus or, or when we need to achieve an ecologic and economic or a social goal for our operations. Yeah, Joe, I th there's a there's a whole lot to unpack here. And I want to remind everybody that this is being recorded. So we will be able to, you know, watch this again. But that, I think that's a great point. One thing that I always I talk to producers about in it, it really hits home to me. Um, looking back at photos with my wife of our kids, and you see, uh, you see photos of, of your kids, uh, you know, eight years ago when they're a year old and you say to yourself, man, I can't believe uh, that he used to look like that and how much he's changed. So that's the single most important thing to me in my life. And it's not until I look at that photo from eight years ago until I really realize and understand the, cha the changes uh, that he's gone through. So, you know, I think a lot of times we remember the highs and we remember the lows and, uh, and so those photo points are a great tool. I'm really glad. Uh, I'm really, really glad you brought brought that up. Um, and then, and then I, I think another great point that you you made is on the carbon and, and the opportunities that we have. Um, it, as far as I'm concerned, it really doesn't make a difference of which side of the coin uh, you set on on the carbon uh, climate change discussion. We have an opportunity as an industry. Uh, it's right for us to be able to capitalize on. Um, what others are uh, around us and the money that might be coming in for, for the management of that. So it's really an opportunity for us to take advantage of and thanks for bringing that up. And, and you know, uh, managing with these processes, these principles allow us to be in position to do that uh, along with um, a little bit of monitoring and, uh, and, and some tools to, to help us make uh, these, these decisions and to capture some of this data. Um, and the biodiversity was one thing that you hit on above ground and below ground, and that's and I think that's part of that discussion. Um, I know you work a lot with with producers, um, and and so if it's somebody that's getting started in the regenerative discussion, or uh, or somebody that's just trying to improve uh, what they're doing, um, where when you're working with, with producers, where do you start? Um, how, how, how does how does a farmer or rancher go about implementing some of these processes or these ideas? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the first place to start is right here, is getting the right mindset. Because if you don't have the right mindset when you go into this, um, it, it's it's likely it's likely not to work. Um, you know. I think that, um, you know, having having that open mindset and understanding that we don't know everything and um, uh, 
uh, you know, just just having that that understanding that this is, you know, it's this idea of being complex versus complicated. You can write a, a manuscript and a standard operating procedure and a, and a recipe to build something complicated, but something that's complex like that landscape behind you, um, there's all these systems are working and they're all fighting for balance. And so it's it's very complex and as we as landowners and managers try to, uh, you know, apply our our management to it um we need to know where to start and so again always start it with the soils understand where you're going to get the greatest return on investment for your management time and your dollar um and then and then from a grazing perspective i you know one of the one of the the biggest limiters on on any of this is it's water um typically um if, if you want to increase grazing distribution in our part of the world on most of the ones that we work with water is typically it's not forage that's limiting its water and water availability so you know if i'm going to spend x amount of dollars i'm going to i may spend 90 percent of that on water development um because uh you know you can grow as much forage as you want but if it's on the back side of the pasture and the cows aren't going to get to it it's not going to help you and so uh water development's key um but really going just just stepping back and working through the process, really figuring out what kind of goal you have for an operation and make them smart goals. They're specific, measurable, um, relatable, attainable, and time bound. Um, make sure you have good solid goals for the operation and inventory those resources. Um, assess your alternatives. There's a bunch of alternatives out there. I know people kind of get lost there, um, but once you've decided and you've talked to your peers, uh, your neighbors, what's worked for them in the past, work, make a decision and move forward. Because one of the better things about moving uh, cattle with a little more frequency, and that's one thing that we probably ought to talk about just briefly is, is this idea that you have to move cattle every day. I think it's kind of a, a misnomer. Um, this idea of moving cattle every day, is, it's all about getting a specific density on a per piece of ground for a specific action. Um, it's a tool. Uh, we don't use it every day. We move cattle very frequently, but we don't do it all the time. We do it for a specific reason. We do it in a certain season. And so, um, you know, having the resources to be able to do that, make those decisions, um, and then evaluate and monitor your, your changes. If you're moving cattle pretty frequently and you make a mistake, guess what? You can fix it in three days or one day. Um, so it just gives you a little more flexibility and adaptability. And, and that's the thing that's, that's key here is being adaptive. This word adaptive and flexible is the key to all of this stuff that nothing in grazing management should be prescriptive. And I think we've gone down that road a long ways and we probably should find the fork and go, <laughs> go, go the other direction. Yeah. Yeah, I agreed. You know, um, I'm hesitant to put a, a prescriptive grazing prescription on a calendar because uh, it seems like you get locked in that calendar and it says I'm not supposed to move till you know till August uh, October 3rd and we we don't pay attention to what's going on until October 3rd and uh, uh, you know I think I think another thing on on where do I start is we have to set realistic expectations of what success is and uh, and depending on where you're at the changes are even slower uh, than other parts of the country and um, you know, I always like to think that's what we do on our on our grazing operation here on our farm is uh, as long as we're getting better every day or doing the things to help us get better every day, that's a success. And uh, as long as we're not going backwards or if we do go backwards, we figure out why we went backwards and 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 move move forward fr from that. Um, and and you know, to the move move every day. Uh, I think it's great if folks want to get there and it fits their operations. We don't move every day either because it just doesn't fit our operations. But I do think one of the worst things that somebody just getting started out is going from one pasture to uh, to 102 and making you know hourly moves. Um, there's some things that everybody has to figure out along that process. So maybe it's e it's easier to make a change, evaluate, see what what you like, what you don't like, what you did. Uh, wrong, what you can improve on, and then keep on um, growing from there. Um, so, um, we're, we're, we're uh, Jeff, I think it's a pretty good conversation. One one last thing that that I might kind of um, want to end on is, you we discussed um, maybe the word regenerative, uh, kind of maybe in the 80s started a group of agronomic row crop producers that were trying to mimic 
um, healthy range land. Um, so I'll throw this out here uh, and, and let you expand on it. In my opinion, a grazing animal is part of that uh, to complete those nutrient and energy cycles and, and biodiversity is also. So without getting in the weeds too much about the principles of soil health, uh, can we just discuss a little bit about the importance of biodiversity? Yeah, I mean, the, it, there's there's a reason that, that um, you know, one of the soil health principles is to increase diversity. We know uh, if you do a literature for search even very far, we know that when we when we begin to increase diversity, we increase product uh, production. Um, you know that that was one of the the one of the original things that sort of was the aha moment for for Gabe Brown. If you know who Gabe Brown is, one of the early pioneers in in soil health, and and you know he was he was doing single cover crops and it wasn't really working. Well, he just got frustrated one day and put them all in there and it it outproduced all of his monoculture um, uh, uh, plots there so from that point on he was sold on the on the importance of diversity and so you know when you, when you mother nature hates monocultures and so when when you when you look at when you look at what happens when we try to fight it and 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 create a monoculture what happens well she tries to put weeds in the system or what we typically call weeds um She's trying to diversity is trying to be brought back into that system because there's there's something that's being neglected. And so as as we begin to manage or manage and it doesn't it's it's really land use agnostic if you know whether it's a cropland field or, or an introduced pasture or native rangeland where we might have 150 different species on an acre. I mean, those those plants are there for a reason. They're all fitting a, a specific niche and they're also providing uh, different uh, metabolites for the biology. Um, and so as we, uh, I don't think, I don't know that, in, in, imagine if we lived in a community and everybody was a plumber, you know, what happens when the light goes out, we're going to be in trouble. And so um, as we, as we begin to think about diversity, I, I think it's diversity is good in all aspects of our lives. No, that, that's a great point. And uh, so I, Jeff, I really appreciate the conversation. Um, I hope folks got a lot out of it. And I know we've already got uh, some questions from it that maybe we can address uh, in a few minutes in the Q&A. Um, so um, look forward to that. Thanks for what you do uh, with Noble Research Institute and what you do for helping producers on the ground. And um, happy to be here. To the, yep. So I think next on the agenda, we might have a, a little bit of a showcase of of AgriWeb and it's, it's grazing insights tool. So Kobe, um, would you would you like to give us a little demo? Yeah, absolutely. And I know that everyone's eager to jump into Q and A, so I'll be pretty quick. I think a lot of questions since we are pretty new in the United States is what is AgriWeb? Well, uh, we're a livestock enterprise management system that kind of takes your records to the next level and allows you to better manage your ranch as a whole. So. On the topic of grazing, it sounds like, I mean, between Jen's intraday moves and, and Bob's uh, uh, rotational design and, and a few other uh, uh, management designs, uh, our, our, our product is really centered around the map and, and the founding design of it is to be conscious of grazing. So this is just my desktop screen. Um, this is our new individual animal management program, but we also have herd uh, based grazing schemes as well. But for any one of these groups, you can simply just click on here um, and look at the total acres available on this operation. Uh, see the current feed on offer, the, day, uh, the days that those animals have been there and the days they're remaining on this pasture before uh, we project that they should be moved. Whether you're on a mobile app and working offline or on the desktop, a drag and drop is all you need. You can see right here in the, the timestamp, it timestamps down to the minute of when you're moving those animals. So like Jane's intraday moves on, on her development heifer program, we'll be able to look at, okay, six hours, what's the animal unit load for those six hours? And how does that turn into animal unit days per acre? Just the drag and drop captures it on a time-based system. So whether you're moving every three hours or every three months, um, you should have an accurate design on, on uh, how many animal unit days are there. Even though we always encourage people to 
to look at animal units and, and look at animal unit equivalents to normalize and baseline their, their consumption as opposed to relying on head days of stockers versus cows, that gets a little difficult to compare when you're running both. Uh, the way that we have designed AgriWeb and this new grazing feature for individual management systems is in your farm settings, you can go into the settings and actually define what an animal unit looks like for you. And you can do stocking rates, animal units per acre or acres per animal unit. So under my regime, I'm currently doing a 2.6% of body weight uh, as far as consumption. So one animal unit equal, equal, or consumes 26 pounds of forage per day, but you can also base this off of just basic animal unit weights. That gets down to the nitty gritty science of megajoules or joules per day of energy required to maintain that animal. And then we also have basic age ranges and the, the basic, um, for any age class, the basic animal units there. So if you're a system that doesn't weigh your animals often, no problem, you can count a cow as a cow uh, pretty simply. But what this allows us to do is when we go into the reports on AgriWeb and I'll just go into the individuals, we were able to look at paddock grazing intensity and animal unit loads by paddock across the, the, these different pastures. So as opposed to my ranch one, runs one animal unit for every 10 acres, uh, we can now look at this and see, okay, what does every pasture do? What's the productivity of every pasture and the stocking rate of every pasture? Uh, my personal favorite tab on this is this cum cumulative stocking load. And this just breaks down every pasture across your operation in animal unit days. So if I just wanna sort this up, I can see which pastures are the most productive on my operation, when they were grazed, and exactly how many animal units as I define them are accrued on any given pasture in any given month. You can see these zeros, that's just the resting period for, for um, the grazing side of things. But at the end of the month, at the end of the, the grazing cycle, at the end of the year, you can start to wait and understand why is Sand Hill's pasture, um, Sand Hill's pasture three more productive than Sand, Hill, Sand Hill's pasture 11 and really look, is it the number of days I grazed it? Um, what's my rating on that grazing? And really dive down into the overall carrying capacity, the overall or, all stocking rate and the ROI for that new subdivision, that ROI over the course of the six years that it might take to subdivide your pastures, the ROI of how many animal unit days I have received in return for that subdivision. Paddock grazing intensity is also another great metric that I, I look at a lot. You can see the days empty. Um, you can see the livestock load on animal unit days per, per acre. And I think because I changed the settings, it's loading a little bit, but it'll break down and consolidate these into single line items based off of pastures. When it comes to forage, you can jump in here and once a year, three times a year, depending on how you would like to rate these, you can always select, let's say my Colorado River pastures I can always select these, uh, these pastures and their similar soil type. And let's say my initial uh, forage projection is going to be today, we're kind of at the end of the grazing cycle and I, there are 1500 pounds of dry matter per acre. When I save that down, it updates that forage. So next time animals come in there, I can have a, a close estimate of how many days worth of grazing uh, should be around. But then I'll get two in the weeds, the system works both online and offline. And uh, this is just the grazing functionality that, that, that we support. So Rob, I can hand it back to you so we can step into Q&A. That sounds great. Thanks, Kobe. Uh, I look forward to the Q&A, but I, I assume anybody who has any more questions uh, can reach out to, to the Agro folks and uh, get a little bit more in depth in, in some of that. But we, I appreciate that, uh, that, that, that quick preview. That's great. Um, we do have some questions already. I think first ones uh, here may be addressed to Jeff and or Bob. Um, and I, I think maybe this one's from Bill Fox. It says, as emerging markets begin to mature, uh, i.e. carbon, water, biodiversity, et cetera, what are your thoughts as landowners or land managers for evaluating and or entering into these ecosystem services space? Um, Whichever, Jeff, well, you want to, you or Bob, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I'll jump in first. Uh, 
and and uh, probably kind of take those one at a time. But uh, from our standpoint, uh, we kind of thought that uh, one of the reasons we contracted with AgriWeb is to be able to kind of keep uh, keep better records on our uh, our pasture utilization and uh, days rested and have have uh, a better history there uh, going going through our rotations that we have uh, and kind of in preparation if some of these markets present themselves uh, that they might be something that we want to get involved with. The uh, From my point of view, personally, the biodiversity market uh, certainly seems to present uh, a lot more a lot more opportunity for us just because we're already kind of in that uh, uh, wildlife monitoring and harvesting uh, business and, uh, and, and also uh, native rangeland monitoring business. So I, uh, that, that seems to kind of pique my interest more. Uh, we're going to be watching that market just from, uh, from my experience with some of the uh, sustainability roundtables. Uh, the biodiversity market seems to be pretty far off as far as being able to uh, really utilize a good metric or, or a common metric that, that's gonna that's gonna work uh, across the industry. And uh, I think we're a ways away on that and I think we're a ways away on the carbon. Uh, the carbon certainly uh, I'm not discouraged by it, but uh, we do have some of those factors uh, there that uh, that give me pause uh, that, that could could present some risk and I think probably will present some risk in, in uh, the cases of additionality and permanence, uh, things that are associated with some of the climate accords. So I think we've we've uh, the ecosystem services people have uh, spent quite a bit of time trying to basically get around that and uh you know and i think they've got some some pretty good uh options there but uh you know we're, we're not there yet and and that's something uh when you talk about a climate accord that that uh in my eyes is going to be a difficult thing to uh to find some compromise solutions there in the future so uh, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, water, I think, is probably uh, something that that uh, we we certainly are going to be paying a lot more attention to in the future of being able to to get some uh, pretty good metrics on measuring uh, water. We've got a little bit of data uh, on our place uh, for uh, evapotranspiration rates that are improvements that have happened uh, basically in some restorative work that we've done in clearing some uh, heavy brush pastures and converting them to better uh, grasslands and more open <laughs> grasslands. And, uh, but we haven't done a whole lot on, on the just runoff uh, measurements. And so that's something we're sure thinking, thinking about in the future, so. I, I just might make a comment or two, Rob. Uh, certainly, additionality and permanence to Bob's point are, are certainly two barriers, potential barriers that have been driven out of the offset markets. And um, there, there's there's a number of companies out there uh, and organizations, uh, startups that are trying to to figure out how to to navigate this space that might benefit the the uh, the private landowner, um, the farmer and the rancher. When you look at per, uh, at you know their it's, it's really this idea of what is permanence. Um, you know, the argument is that the, the pollution is permanent. So the offset or the credit needs to be permanent. So they're, off, you know, typically offering things like 100 year easements. Well, that's a non starter for most landowners. To me, permanence is not a legal document. It's six generations of ranchers on the ground ranching. Um, and so, you know, things like additionality is also faced a lot of producers, um, you know, not not paying the producers that are that are that are currently doing a, a, a practice. I know some of the some of the uh, groups that are that are develop, trying to develop markets currently are, are facing that battle. One that has tried to get out around it pretty easily is is uh, a company called Grassroots Carbon. They're using the B carbon standard 
and um, and they've they, they have a a little bit of a unique way of of standardizing and measuring their soil carbon, um, and 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 are they're they're still battling with with uncertainty um, with the, the the standards and the methodologies, but they do have a, a methodology and they're putting um, grazing land. Uh, contracts now out in in the and they've tried they've, they've got some pretty unique ways to get around additionality and permanence that have worked for them and so that's that's promising i agree with bob i think the the, the biodiversity idea is great i think we're i think we're a ways off from that um coming to fruition but um at the end of the day uh farmers and ranchers have been producing two producing a number of ecosystem services for thousands of years and they've only been paid for two of them food and fiber so it's time we figure out a better way yeah and rob just jumping in here um i just working with a lot of ranchers across the country i i often get the question similar questions about uh ecosystem services and, and where to profit like and we've talking spoken to a lot of different people that are looking at carbon capturing and sequestration. And, and that question of additionality always comes up with, I've been managing this for, for 20 years. Uh, like how can I capitalize on, uh, on carbon credits for the last 20 years? Well, unless you have an ironclad way of measuring th your, your historical records and, and saying, nope, this is how I've been rotating animals for 15, 20 years, however long, it's kind of a non-starter, right? Like, so we just say whether it's AgriWeb or something else, just start capturing those records in a manner uh, in which it will be preserved in history and it can be looked back on and, and support your, your overall claims when it comes to management. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. <clears throat> and, I, and I do, and I, it, the permanence is an issue and, the, uh, it, and it, we're gonna get, get past it and get over it, but it's one of the few things where you, at the beginning you, uh, Seems like you're getting penalized for doing doing what you're supposed to be doing and doing a good job. So I know that's going to be overcome and working on it. Um, so I just wanted to remind everybody to feel free to to, to throw some questions in the, the Q and A there uh, if anybody has any. Um, There's uh, one there, question there from Matt. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, well, go ahead, Jeff. You got it's it. in the chat there. I don't know if you who you'd like to answer that. It's about soil sampling. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Jeff. Do, do the first, if you repeat the question for us, and then we'll I let anybody add. else. So Matt asked, uh, any suggestions on a good cost-effective uh, soil test to get started with, or get started with uh, measuring carbon and microbial activity? I might take a stab at that. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a couple of there. There's several commercial. Um, soil tests out there that are that are pretty help um uh, widely available and uh I, i'm not going to say that they're cost cost effective <laughs> um but uh really when it boils down to it i mean there's the haney test that's uh that's done by a number of labs developed by dr rick haney um it, it looks at water extractable organic carbon uh which is that that active carbon fraction that's available to to new to um uh, to microbes um it it has a number of other metrics that are that are very good from the soil health perspective water extractable organic nitrogen as well um, it does not measure soil organic carbon by dry combustion which is the industry standard uh, for estimating soil organic carbon, um, there there is some there is some pretty interesting uh, methodologies being put together around using um, near infrared spectroscopy uh, to measure soil organic carbon to reduce those costs uh, over time. Um, but as far as microbial activity, really uh, the only one that's currently available that's uh, um, the the cash test at Cornell is a good one. It gives some gives some pretty good metrics, but the, the phospholipid fatty acid test, PLFA test is available through most of these uh, regenerative focused labs. Um, and it'll give you a decent idea on um, uh, biomass of things like arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, um, soil bacteria, and also those ratios and percentages. Uh, the tough part with that is there's usually a fair amount that's quote unquote undifferentiated. Um, they just don't know what it is. Uh, but thinking it's a pretty good test to uh, to, to develop trends. 
neither one of them are very cheap. I mean, they're, you're talking 50 to 70 bucks on those samples, but if it's a one time a year deal, it's probably not a bad, uh, a bad thing. You don't, you don't necessarily need, uh, you need to, to man, monitor representative sites across the ranch. You don't have to wear, measure every acre. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a great explanation, Jeff. Appreciate that. Uh, Jen, we, we, you had one earlier that you answered uh, uh, on text, but I was wondering if maybe you'd like to share uh, with the group. Uh, you were asked if you were monitoring soil carbon in, in your program right now. Yeah, so we actually just took our first um, soil carbon measurements ever about a month ago. Um, we are part of a, a branching co-op that sells beef into a specific company and Country Natural Beef is kind of doing a pilot program for a regenerative grazing certification. Um, and we were actually the first ranch in the nation. Um, the team came out and took soil carbon samples, but also water infiltration, um, plant diversity, photo points, you know, many different things. Um, and, you know, I would say we're, I'm very interested to see you know, what that turns out to be. I, but I would say I'm much more interested in trend over time. Um, you know, this one data point is gonna be interesting. It's not really gonna be important until, you know, we have multiple years of data. And I would just say, you know, probably how we think about all of this carbon measuring or, you know, soil bio, biology, um, all that, uh, the Johnson family tends to be um, horrible detail people um, and much better uh, big picture people. Uh, we, you know, don't plant ID well. Um, <laughs> we're, we're much more, more is more. You know, we want more species of grass, more species of wildlife and more numbers of everything. Um, and that's kind of how we judge ourselves on, you know, how are we doing this year in this rotation? Um, and, you know, I think all this ecosystem service talk is, you know, I can't wait to make millions of dollars off of carbon and all this thing, but we are going to do our management system because it makes us profitable ranchers, period. Um, so I think whether or not this stuff comes to fruition next month, next year, or 10 years from now, um, we are going to be doing the practices that we believe in for the sustainability of our family business and our land health. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad to be in the position that the technology has to catch up with us. Um, you know, I think we've proven it to ourselves um, and, you know, are gonna keep doing it until somebody else can prove it to themselves um, in a scientific way. Right, and I, I can't think of a better statement uh, to wrap wrap this up with. Um, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, you gotta be doing it uh, because you feel uh, that's the right thing to do and the, and the right way to be doing it. And I really appreciate that, Jen, and, and you're doing it to, to make sure that you're profitable based off your management. And if there's a market that comes along because of it, great. Um, so I wanna thank all the panelists uh, Jen, Jeff, Bob, Kobe, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to do this. I would uh, give uh, let everybody know there is one more resource uh, I want everybody to know of to, to help with their management. Um, like I said, I am the vice president of the National Grazing Lands Coalition. Uh, the National Grazing Lands Coalition is a coalition of about 13 organizations that have come together uh, to give representative to the national board whose mission uh, is is uh, the National Grazing Lands Coalition is dedicated to providing voluntary, ecological, and economically sound management of all grazing lands for their adaptive uses and multiple benef benefits uh, to the environment of, and, and society through the science-based technical assistance and research and education. I want everybody to know that uh, Nat GLC, National Grazing Lands Coalition, is having their eighth National Grazing Conference. It's held every three years. But it's this this year, December 6th through the 9th in, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And uh, you can register for that at grazinglands.org. And uh, I did mention the Texas Section Society for Range Management earlier, uh, that Bob will be there, will be touring his ranch. And if you're in Texas deadline, uh, to register for that is tomorrow. Um, 
but thanks to everyone. Uh, I think it was a great discussion and, um, and, and, and look forward to the contacts that I've been able to make. Hopefully that's another benefit for everybody and everybody's been able to make a few more uh, contacts from this also. Kobe, anything else? No, um, not yet. I saw one more cue came in. Um, Matt, if you just want to email me this question at cobybuck at agriweb.com, um, I'm more than happy to kind of walk you through the different ways that I advise ranchers to put in the initial forage and, and in pasture capacity. But um, no, thank you very much for, for the panelists. It was an awesome discussion, but very happy to have you join. I know that there were tef technical difficulties, but your presence is always appreciated. And we look forward to talking to people next time. Thank y'all. Thank you.